My name is Melissa, and I grew up in a typical middle-class family. Mom worked as a nurse, and Dad was a mechanic. We weren't rich, but we had enough to get by comfortably. After graduating from college with a degree in education, I landed a job at a public elementary school in my hometown. My days were filled with lesson plans, finger paintings, and the infectious laughter of children. One Friday evening, my best friend Sarah insisted I join her for a party. Reluctantly, I agreed. I threw on a simple blue dress and headed to the address Sarah had texted me. The party was in full swing when I arrived, the small apartment packed with people I didn't know. Melissa, Sarah's voice cut through the noise. She appeared at my side, grinning widely. I'm so glad you came. There's someone I want you to meet. Before I could protest, she was dragging me through the crowd. We stopped in front of a tall, handsome man with dark hair and warm brown eyes. Melissa, this is Jack, Sarah said, practically beaming. Jack, meet my best friend, Melissa. Jack smiled and extended his hand. Nice to meet you, Melissa. Sarah's told me a lot about you. We fell into an easy conversation about my job, his work as a software developer, and our shared love of old movies. Before I knew it, hours had passed, and the party was winding down. As I was getting ready to leave, Jack approached me. I really enjoyed talking to you tonight, Melissa. Would you like to grab coffee sometime? My heart skipped a beat. I'd like that, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. We exchanged numbers, and I left the party feeling giddy. The next day, I woke up to a text from Jack. Good morning, Melissa. How about that coffee? Are you free this afternoon? I replied quickly, and we made plans to meet at a local cafe. That coffee date was the beginning of something special. Over the next few weeks, Jack and I saw each other regularly. We went to movies, tried new restaurants, and took long walks in the park. With each date, I felt myself falling for him more and more. One evening, about a month after we met, Jack took me to a fancy restaurant for dinner. As we finished our meal, he reached across the table and took my hand. Melissa, he said, his eyes serious. I really like you. I was wondering if you'd like to be my girlfriend? My heart soared. Yes, Jack. I'd love to be your girlfriend. Jack was everything I'd ever wanted in a partner, kind, funny, and supportive. One evening, as we cuddled on my couch watching an old black and white film, I turned to Jack. Have you told your parents about us? I asked, trying to keep my tone casual. Jack's body tensed slightly. Not yet, he replied, his eyes fixed on the TV screen. I haven't found the right moment. I'll tell them when the time is right. I wanted to press the issue, but something in Jack's demeanor made me hold back. Instead, I snuggled closer to him, pushing my concerns to the back of my mind. The next week, I invited Jack to dinner at my parents' house. Mom and Dad had been asking to meet him for weeks, and I was excited for them to get to know the man I was falling in love with. Mom, Dad, this is Jack, I said, beaming as we walked into the living room. My parents welcomed Jack warmly. Mom had prepared her famous pot roast, and we all sat down to a lovely meal. The conversation flowed easily, with Jack charming my parents with stories about his work and his travels. The evening ended on a high note, with my parents pulling me aside as Jack went to get our coats. He's wonderful, honey, Mom whispered, giving me a hug. We're so happy for you. As Jack and I drove home, I couldn't help but bring up the subject of his parents again. Jack, why haven't you introduced me to your family yet? Are you ashamed of me? Jack's hands tightened on the steering wheel. Of course not, Melissa. It's just, my parents can be a bit difficult. I want to make sure the timing is right. I sighed, not entirely satisfied with his answer, but decided to let it go for now. Our relationship continued to grow stronger over the next year and a half. Yet, the issue of his parents remained a sore spot. Every time I brought it up, Jack would find a way to change the subject or make light of the situation. I tried to be patient, to trust that he had his reasons, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was hiding something from me. 
Then, on a crisp autumn evening, everything changed. Jack proposed to me at the restaurant, and I agreed to the sound of applause from other customers. On the drive home, still giddy with excitement, I turned to Jack. I can't wait to tell my parents. They're going to be so thrilled. Jack smiled, but I noticed a hint of tension in his expression. Actually, Mel, I think it's time you met my parents. How about we go see them this weekend? I was surprised by the sudden change of heart, but delighted nonetheless. Really? That would be wonderful, Jack. When we pulled up to Jack's childhood home, I couldn't help but gasp. The house was enormous, a sprawling mansion with manicured lawns and a fountain in the circular driveway. In the parking area, I spotted three luxury cars that probably cost more than my yearly salary. Jack, I whispered, my eyes wide. You never told me your family was, well, rich. He shrugged, looking uncomfortable. It never seemed important. Come on, let's go in. As we approached the front door, it swung open to reveal a statuesque woman with perfectly coiffed hair and an expensive-looking suit. Jack, darling, she exclaimed, pulling him into a hug. Her eyes fell on me, and I saw a flicker of something, disappointment, cross her face. And you must be Melissa, she said, her tone noticeably cooler. I'm Victoria, Jack's mother, please, come in. We followed her into a lavish living room where Jack's father, Richard, was waiting. He greeted us warmly, shaking my hand with a firm grip. So, you're the young lady who's stolen our Jack's heart, he said with a smile. Victoria gestured for us to sit and then began her interrogation. So, Melissa, tell us about yourself. What do you do for a living? I'm a teacher at Jefferson Elementary, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. I teach third grade. Victoria's eyebrows rose. A teacher? Hell, quaint. And your family? What do they do? I explained about my parents' occupations, watching as Victoria's expression grew more and more disapproving. By the time I finished, the atmosphere in the room was tense. Victoria smiled tightly. Well, Melissa, she said, her voice dripping with false sweetness. I must say, you're not quite what I had in mind for Jack. You're simply not the kind of girl I envisioned as a daughter-in-law. I felt as if I'd been slapped. Tears pricked up my eyes, but I refused to let them fall. Richard cleared his throat. Victoria, that's enough. Jack is old enough to make his own decisions about who he wants to marry. Victoria pursed her lips, but said nothing more. The rest of the visit passed in uncomfortable small talk until Jack and I made our excuses to leave. As we drove home in silence, I finally let the tears fall. They hate me, don't they? I choked out. Jack reached over and took my hand. They don't hate you, Mel. My mother, she's just very particular. That's why I put off this meeting for so long. I'm sorry you had to go through that. In the months following our engagement, Jack and I threw ourselves into wedding planning. We wanted a small, intimate ceremony with just our closest friends and family. However, Victoria had other ideas. One afternoon, as Jack and I were discussing potential venues, my phone rang. It was Victoria. Melissa, dear, she said, her voice sickly sweet. I've been thinking about your wedding. I've taken the liberty of contacting some of the finest venues in the city. Oh, and I have a list of at least a hundred guests we simply must invite. I felt my stomach drop. That's very kind of you, Victoria, but Jack and I were hoping for something smaller. Nonsense, she interrupted. My son is getting married. It has to be a grand affair. I want all my friends to see how happy he is. The next day, we met with Victoria to discuss the wedding plans. Jack was firm, explaining that we wanted a small ceremony and couldn't afford an extravagant affair. Victoria's face turned cold. I see. Well, if that's how you feel, perhaps I should withdraw my offer to help. After all, it seems you two have it all figured out. Despite the tension, we stood our ground. In the end, we planned the wedding we wanted, a simple ceremony in a local park, followed by a reception at a charming restaurant. The morning of the wedding arrived, 
and I was a bundle of nerves. The ceremony was beautiful. Jack's eyes filled with tears as I walked down the aisle, and when we said our vows, I felt like my heart might burst with happiness. During the toasts, Victoria stood up, glass in hand. My stomach clenched, dreading what she might say. Well, she began, her voice carrying across the room. This certainly isn't the wedding I envisioned for my son. But I suppose we must make do with what we have. A shocked murmur ran through the guests. Victoria continued, her words becoming increasingly critical of the simple decorations, the food, and even my dress. With each word, I felt smaller and more humiliated. Finally, she turned her gaze directly to me. I must say, I'm not entirely comfortable in this, company. I think it's best if I take my leave early. With that, she set down her glass and swept out of the room, leaving a stunned silence in her wake. Our friends and family rallied around us, offering words of support and trying to lift the mood. Gradually, the party resumed, and by the end of the night, Victoria's dramatic exit was almost forgotten in the joy of celebration. After our honeymoon, Jack and I settled into married life in his apartment. However, my happiness was short-lived as Victoria began to make her presence felt in increasingly intrusive ways. One afternoon, I came home early from school to find Victoria in our living room, rearranging our furniture. I was shocked to see her there, especially since we hadn't given her a key. When Jack got home, I told him what had happened. He looked uncomfortable, but promised to talk to his mother about boundaries. However, Victoria's unexpected visits continued. She'd show up unannounced, always with some excuse about helping or checking on us. One day, as I was leaving for work, I overheard Victoria talking to our neighbor, Mrs. Johnson, in the hallway. I stopped short when I heard my name. You know, you really should keep an eye on Melissa, Victoria was saying in a low voice. She comes from a, less desirable area. One can never be too careful with their jewelry. Over the next few weeks, I noticed a change in how some of our neighbors treated me. Friendly smiles were replaced with wary glances, and casual conversations in the elevator became awkward silences. It was clear that Victoria's words had had an effect. That evening, I broke down in tears as I told Jack what I'd overheard. He was angry and immediately confronted his mother, demanding she return the spare key she'd somehow obtained. Victoria's response was to play the victim, accusing me of turning her son against her. She began posting thinly veiled criticisms of me on social media, never mentioning me by name but making it clear who she was talking about. Then, one day, I was called into the principal's office at school. Mr. Thompson, my boss, looked uncomfortable as he slid an envelope across his desk to me. Melissa, we received this, complained about you, he said, his voice kind but concerned. Normally, we don't put much stock in anonymous letters, but given the nature of the accusations, I felt I should bring it to your attention. With trembling hands, I opened the envelope and read the letter. It was a litany of false accusations, everything from theft to inappropriate behavior with students. My mind reeled. There was only one person who could be behind this, Victoria. Mr. Thompson assured me he didn't believe the accusations, but warned me that rumors had started circulating among some of the staff. As I left his office, I could feel the stares of my colleagues, hear the whispers behind my back. As the months passed, what should have been joyous family gatherings turned into nightmarish ordeals. Every holiday, every family dinner became an opportunity for Victoria to belittle and humiliate me in front of Jack's friends and relatives. The breaking point came at a party Victoria hosted at her home. I'd worn a simple white skirt, feeling pretty and competent for once. As the evening wore on, I noticed people giving me odd looks and snickering behind their hands. It wasn't until Jack arrived late and pulled me aside that I learned the horrifying truth. Mel, he said, his face a mix of anger and embarrassment, there's a huge red stain on the back of your skirt. It looks like ketchup. My cheeks burned with humiliation as I realized I'd been walking around all evening with this stain, completely unaware. But worse was to come. Victoria, it seemed, had been busy taking photos of me throughout the night, always angled to prominently display the stain. 
By the time we got home, these photos were all over social media, accompanied by Victoria's mocking comments. The next day at school was a nightmare. Some of my students had seen the photos, and I could hear their whispered jokes and giggles. It took all my strength not to break down in tears in front of my class. That evening, I told Jack I couldn't take it anymore. I'm done with these family gatherings, I said, my voice trembling. I can't keep subjecting myself to your mother's cruelty. To my relief, Jack agreed. You're right, Mel. We'll stop attending. My mother's behavior is unacceptable. Amidst this turmoil, I discovered I was pregnant. For a brief, shining moment, I hoped this news might soften Victoria's heart. Perhaps the prospect of a grandchild would bring peace to our fractured family. I couldn't have been more wrong. Victoria's reaction to the news was chilling. Are you sure it's Jax? She asked, her voice dripping with insinuation. After all, you two haven't been around much lately. Who knows what you've been up to? I was stunned by her accusation, but I soon realized it was more than just cruel words. I began to notice a car following me on my way to and from work. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, but the same nondescript sedan kept appearing wherever I went. Shaken, I called the police. To my shock, when they tracked down and questioned the man, he admitted he was a private detective hired by Victoria to follow me. She had convinced herself that I was cheating on Jack and that the baby wasn't his. When Jack found out, he was livid. He confronted his mother in a heated phone call that I could hear from across the room. Victoria, caught red-handed, had no choice but to call off the detective. Months passed, and soon it was time for our baby to arrive. The delivery was long and difficult, but when I finally held our son in my arms, all the pain melted away. However, as I looked at him, I noticed something unexpected. Our beautiful baby boy had a much darker complexion than either Jack or me. He looked, almost, biracial. A seed of doubt planted itself in my mind. Would Jack think I'd been unfaithful? Before he could voice any suspicions, I insisted on a DNA test. The wait for the results was agonizing, but finally, we got the news, Jack was indeed our son's biological father. The doctor, seeing our confusion, suggested another possibility. It's possible this trait comes from one of your parents. We could do DNA tests on them as well, to trace the genetic line. My parents, when approached with the idea, were calm and agreeable. They understood our confusion and were happy to help solve the mystery. But the thought of telling Victoria made my blood run cold. Given her past accusations and behavior, I feared how she might react to this news. Would she use this as ammunition in her ongoing campaign against me? As I cradled our beautiful, mysterious baby boy, I looked at Jack. What are we going to do? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Jack took my hand, his eyes full of love and determination. We're going to love our son, no matter what. And we'll get to the bottom of this. Together. The day Victoria first saw her grandson should have been a joyous occasion. Instead, it turned into a nightmare. As soon as she laid eyes on our beautiful baby boy, her face contorted with shock and disgust. What is this? She shrieked, recoiling from the crib. This child is too dark. He can't be Jack's. Before I could even respond, she rounded on me, her eyes blazing with fury. You whore. You cheated on my son with some black guy from the alley, didn't you? Victoria, please, I begged, tears welling in my eyes. We've done a DNA test. Jack is the father. I've never been unfaithful. But she was beyond reason. She stormed out of our apartment, and I thought that was the end of it. I was wrong. A few hours later, when I returned from a quick errand, I found all of my belongings strewn across the hallway outside our apartment. Clothes, books, even my underwear, all scattered on the floor for anyone to see. I stood there, shocked and humiliated, as neighbors peeked out of their doors to see what the commotion was about. Jack was livid when he came home and saw what his mother had done. He immediately called her, putting her on speakerphone so I could hear. Mom, this has to stop, he shouted. We've done a DNA test. I am the father. 
Melissa has never cheated on me. Victoria's voice was cold and dismissive. DNA tests can be faked. I know what I see. We even had my parents take DNA tests, which confirmed their relationship to our son. But Victoria refused to listen to reason. When we suggested she and Jack's father take tests as well, she categorically refused. Victoria's obsession only grew worse over time. She began calling me from unknown numbers, leaving threatening voicemails. Admit you cheated, or I'll destroy both your careers," she hissed in one particularly chilling message. She sent compromising letters to both Jack's workplace and my school. The stress became so overwhelming that I had to quit my job and find a position at another school across town. But even that wasn't enough. Victoria's campaign of harassment escalated. She planted threatening letters in our mailbox. She even went so far as to hire actors to harass me in public, taking photos of these staged encounters and sending them to Jack as proof of my infidelity. One night, as we lay in bed, both too stressed to sleep, I turned to Jack. I'm worried about your mother, I whispered. This behavior, it's not normal. I think she might need help. Jack nodded slowly. I've been thinking the same thing. But she'd never agree to see someone. The next day, I decided to reach out to Jack's father, Richard. We met at a quiet cafe, away from prying eyes. Over coffee, I poured out everything that had been happening, the harassment, the threats, the elaborate schemes Victoria had concocted. Richard listened, his face growing more and more concerned. When I finished, he sat back with a heavy sigh. I've noticed changes in her behavior, he admitted. But I had no idea it had gotten this bad. You're right, she needs help. But she'd never agree to see a psychiatrist willingly. We spent the next hour brainstorming how we could get Victoria the help she clearly needed without her knowing. Richard's plan was simple, but effective. Under the guise of changing insurance providers, he convinced Victoria to undergo a comprehensive health checkup at a new clinic. To our surprise, she agreed without much fuss. The day of the examination arrived, and we all waited anxiously for the results. When they came, they were more shocking than any of us could have imagined. Victoria was diagnosed with a complex mental illness, one that was genetically transmitted through the female line in her family. The doctor explained that without early intervention, the women in her family tended to experience severe mental health deterioration as they aged. Victoria's erratic behavior and obsessive actions were symptoms of this progressive condition. The news hit us all hard, but it also brought a sense of relief. There was a reason for Victoria's actions, a medical explanation for the torment she had put us through. With the diagnosis came a treatment plan, and Victoria was admitted to a specialized clinic for care. But the revelations didn't stop there. Richard, in an attempt to understand the genetic components of Victoria's condition, decided to undergo genetic testing himself. The results shook our family to its core, Richard was not Jack's biological father. When Richard shared this news with us, the pieces suddenly fell into place. It wasn't me who had been unfaithful, it was Victoria, years ago, with a man of African descent. The very thing she had accused me of, she had done herself. I expected anger or resentment from Richard, but his reaction surprised me. He looked at Jack with tears in his eyes and said, Son, I may not be your biological father, but I raised you. I loved you from the moment you were born, and nothing will ever change that. You are my son in every way that matters. Jack hugged his father tightly, affirming that Richard was and always would be his dad. As for his biological father, Jack decided he had no interest in searching for him. The man who raised me, who stood by me through everything, that's my real father, he declared. With Victoria receiving the care she needed and the truth finally out in the open, a sense of peace settled over our family. Richard, free from Victoria's influence, became a doting grandfather to our son. He would spend hours playing with him, marveling at his curly black hair and striking blue eyes. One evening, as we sat in the living room of Richard's spacious house, he made an unexpected proposal. Why don't you all move in here, he suggested. This place is too big for just me, and I'd love to have my family close. 
Jack and I exchanged glances, then smiled. It felt right, like the beginning of a new chapter for all of us. We agreed, and within a few weeks, we had moved into Richard's home. Life settled into a new, happier rhythm. Our son grew into a handsome, swarthy boy, his mixed heritage evident in his features. But to us, and to everyone who knew our family's story, his appearance was simply a part of who he was, a beautiful, loved child. Victoria remained in the clinic, receiving the care she needed. While we didn't visit often, we made sure she was comfortable and well-treated. It wasn't a perfect ending, but it was one we could live with.